Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. With you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious bosom. For thus says the Lord, I will extend prosperity to her like a river and the wealth of nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice. Your bodies shall flourish like grass. And it shall be known that the hand of the Lord is with his servants and his indignation against his enemies. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Galatians. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The word of the Lord. According to Luke. The Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the, per the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. Say, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the labor deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. 
Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be gracious and pleasing in your sight. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. During those first few exciting months of dating, my now husband, Dan, we planned an evening out. And he came over and asked if he could first hop on my Wi-Fi for a few minutes before we left. And I obliged, and I began puttering with some other project. And after a while, I began wondering what was taking so long, and so I went downstairs to see what he was doing. He was Googling how to remove a spleen. It's also probably important for you to know that my husband is a surgeon. But that might not make you feel a lot better. <laughs> what? He said with this sort of unsettling nonchalance. There's a spleen case tomorrow. I haven't taken one out in a while. <laughs> I thought, that's just not what you want to hear from your surgeon. <laughs> yeah, I went on a date last night, but first I was Googling your guts. <laughs> Seeing a surgeon Google the finer points of surgery was unsettling because the experience took the magic out of my perception of medicine. I mean, he since shared about how oftentimes a day in the OR looks like him just sort of sitting in the corner managing emails while residents operate until they get stuck and kind of wave him over. <laughs> surgery, as it turns out, doesn't really look like the sort of musically orchestrated, gripping OR scenes that you see on TV. Life with Dan has taken the magic out of medicine. Relatedly, I formerly thought that my grade school teachers were also magic. Piano and ballet teachers and Girl Scout leaders and pastors, they all seemed magical too. My classmates and I assumed that the teachers lived at the school and piano teachers lived at the studio and pastors lived at the church. Of course, they knew the mystery of the places they occupied, giving us mere mortals glimpses of the secret lives that they occupied from time to time which is why it was always surprising to sort of run into them in the grocery store produce aisle or maybe in the dentist's waiting room. I think it's sort of jarring when so-called magic gets peeled away from daily life, whether that's the surgeon's cavalier attitude toward the mighty spleen or discovering that Mrs. Kent did not, in fact, reside in our third grade classroom. 
My daughter's kindergarten end of the year report came back to us recently and stirred in with all the necessary information about reading, writing, and arithmetic. The best line of the whole thing reflected, quote, sometimes Marion gets so enthralled with her games that she forgets what is real and what's pretend. And it made me realize that like Marion, we all really crave something magical. We all crave something beautiful. Something unexpected and delightful in real life that has a sense that it gathers in the profound and the glorious and the hopeful and the unexpected, mixing in with the mundane so much so that the lines between the sublime and the ineffable sort of impossibly hold hands with ordinary life. We all want an otherworldly experience. American Christianity, as we know it today, often seeks to arrest the idea of the otherworldly, out-of-body experience of the divine by turning Christianity into sort of fundamentally distant promises of some heaven far, far away. Work hard and be good now in this life so you can enjoy the heavenly afterlife later is a sermon that often gets preached from sea to shining sea pretty regularly on Sunday mornings. So the preacher's job becomes to prod you to do more and more and better and better and to work hard and to be nicer so you can enjoy an experience of afterlife way, way, way out in the future. And that turns funeral sermons into something that goes like, Jim was a hard worker his whole life. He was so generous and so good to everyone. So we can just see him now having a mimosa with Barbara on the mezzanine dancing with all his friends. In part, that vision of God's future comes from the Christianity that emerged during antebellum slave-holding America, when enslaved people were captivated by the promises that they heard from the Bible, with preachers who described a time when all people, including them, had a place at the table. That a time was coming, maybe after death, when, it th when people were invited to a table that was not just a matter of being privileged by economics and race, when violence and grief would be no more, when freedom and justice would be held in trust by everyone. Dare I say, under God with liberty and justice for all. Christianity understandably rolled out a kind of magic during that time, and we still see signs of it today. That idea of wearing your Sunday best comes from slaveholding, and then Jim Crow North America rooted in a dream of something better coming from God above in the afterlife. A day to clean up from the dregs of daily work, to hear good news, which was certainly better than daily news, to feel and to even be free and loved in community, and to have a sense of hope outside of mundane and deadly oppression. In the midst of struggle, the message that one might find in church might feel like a magical escape. But the truth is there isn't much in the Bible that actually talks about heaven and hell the way popular Christianity does in America. God doesn't introduce himself by saying, hey, I do these really cool things and I live in this really great place and someday, if you're really good, then you can join me. Maybe, if you're really good. The truth is the Christian gospel that we've come to trust is connection with God who has promises, not just for the future, but for you and for all people to experience and receive now. Goodness now as a foretaste of the feast to come. So how shocking it is then to witness the scene of sending from Luke's gospel story today. Jesus sends 70 out onto the road with empty hands and shoeless feet. No cash or credit cards, no cell phones, not even a list of contacts or a GPS. No bag and nothing to carry in it, which unsettles the scout in me who always wants to be prepared. <coughs> Greet no one on the road, he says. Just show up at the stranger's doors with a message of peace and the audacious announcement that the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus sends them in pairs to the places that he plans to visit. They have no hostess gifts, they carry no wine and flowers, no hot dish or dessert for the table to offset the impact of arrival. They're not even instructed by Jesus to do the dishes or weed the garden or strip the beds when they're done. 
The work of these laborers is not, asked to, uh, is not to act as host or servant or slave. The goal of these laborers is just to be received, to be welcomed, and in doing so to remove barriers, and I'd even say to remove the so-called magic, the so-called magic from what it is to be sent and received, to serve and to be served. If you've ever visited Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, or watched costume dramas, probably on PBS, you might see that lavish homes from bygone days often keep the kitchen and the scullery far from the sight of all guests, as though meals and clean sheets and service just happen. There were even hiding closets in these little alcoves for slaves and servant staff to sort of hide themselves, avoiding appearances that slaves and service staff made the magic happen at all. In today's gospel, Jesus' goal is to remove the veil of that so-called magic. He does so not so to disabuse us of magical thinking, but to direct us to where real magic happens, in the kingdom of God, and in the life flow that God created for and among you. Jesus sends these empty-handed and barefoot 70, burdened with a message, and remarkably, it's an identical message, <coughs> regardless of the welcome that they receive. Everywhere they go, their message is this. The kingdom of God is here. In the ears of some, this news is going to sound sweet like a gift. While at other doorsteps, in the mean streets of some towns, it's going to sound like a threat that the kingdom of God has come near. So how do you receive this news? How does this announcement find its way to us, thank you, sweetheart, on this 4th of July weekend? This particular weekend is one of national celebration. Tomorrow we'll celebrate our independence, which is a matter of shrugging off royal rule and the birth of this democratic country. It's anachronistic, this message about proclaiming the nearness of a kingdom. Maybe it's even offensive in our land that prides itself on being self-governed and self-contained, regardless of claims to the contrary. We're going to beat our drums, and we're going to toot our horns, and we're going to blow stuff up to demonstrate our freedom. And we're going to take Monday off, too, just to sort of underscore the point about independence and the fact that we don't have to do what other people tell us to. Time will tell whether the dust of our streets testify to our faith or protests our failure to recognize and receive the news that Jesus wants everyone and everywhere to know this that the kingdom of God is near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, Jesus tells his disciples. And whoever rejects you rejects me. I am the gift. Whoever receives me and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me, who is the giver. The kingdom of God is near. It's a provocative claim, not immediately apparent to the eyes, it's carried by folks who are not immediately impressive. <coughs> Excuse me. These people carry no shoes, no bag, no escort. They don't even have like a royal seal to announce on the one on whose behalf they've arrived. Just a word of peace and greeting. And they show up as another chair at the table and another mouth to feed. There's a theologian named Shane Claiborne who suggests that Christianity spreads not by intimidation or propaganda, which are tools of the empire in advertising, but that this message is first received in this world by fascination. The nearness of God is not some magic trick. Rather, people experience the near presence of God first by fascination and with shoeless messengers that bring good news right to the places where you live and love, with the flesh and bone bodies that announce its coming. We believe that God acts in and through common things. Jesus arrives, birthed as a baby in some Bethlehem stable. The kingdom comes near at a table spread in the space between your mouth and your ears, in the greetings of peace. God acts in the world through the words that we hear and speak in, in things like bread and wine and water. This is the basis for our commitment to the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion and to preaching and to the reading of Holy Scripture in our worship. 
The word of God arrives in breath, spoken, sung, sighed, and shared. And it's how we understand the new creation that Paul announces in his letter to the Galatians today. This new creation, the baptized, the community that God gathers as this sort of wildly mixed bunch, this church, the people of God who are the very body of Christ, which includes you and me and her. We are instruments of God's grace. We are the ones who are going to be part of heralding in this kingdom. We're the vagabonds in this world who are given the gospel, so we just give it away. We are called to blur these lines between magical thinking and the mundane reality of everyday life that all of us experience. Like when we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves, when we confess that we have not loved God with our whole heart or our neighbors as ourselves, I can imagine that that practice has a lot to do and has real import in our daily lives. Like when we hear a word of forgiveness in the name of God, which you too can proclaim to those who do you wrong. Like when we leave our purses and bags and jackets in our church pews to walk up here for a scrap of bread and a sip of wine, that might help you imagine how God might call you to offer the same thing for others. It's a sense of magic, except it's real. A little eating, a little drinking, a little confessing and forgiving others when they've done wrong. That's the method and indeed the madness of God's power that unnerves and unseats the very real powers of evil that seek to keep the world spinning on the fuel of very low expectations. Those 70, after they went out, they came back and they were stunned about that part. They return in wonder and they say, Lord, even in your names, the demons submit to us. And Jesus says, I know, right? In other words, it's real. The remarkable and the ordinary sit side by side in today's story. The simple graces of hospitality and a hot meal meet the saving miracles of healing and hope. God's kingdom advances with empty-handed house guests and the willing welcome that they receive at the doorsteps of strangers. And in this upside-down model of any kind of kingdom that's familiar to us and our self-sufficient sensibilities, Jesus sees and announces this new creation, the advent of an age of when, when all evil things, and when evil itself, whom we personify in Satan, the self-appointed master of our economies of stored value and exchange, is unseated, removed, and finally undone. Many have written about the practices of Christian hospitality. It's usually portrayed as an active thing, like giving shelter or sharing food or making blankets or just doing good. And all these real gifts are invaluable in this very broken and hurting world. You all know it. But so is the humble grace of receiving and the humbling grace of being received, of being welcomed, of being forgiven and fed, and of having one's burden seen and known and shared. This is not independence, as what we celebrate on Monday. Neither is it some kind of one-sided dependence. What we celebrate here in church today and what we acknowledge in this gospel is interdependence, the shared strength and common vulnerability of receiving together the kingdom of God. Bear one another's burdens, writes Paul, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. In this way we live according to the purpose and good pleasure of God, whose now and com coming kingdom places us one with another, face to face, in the bare magic come true of God's kingdom among us, on earth as it is in heaven. So in this place I will not wish you a happy Independence Day. You can save that for Monday. Rather, in this church, we wish one another a happy Dependence Day. This day that God brings the near magical gifts of to the true freedom of Christ into your very hands, into your heart, to you and for you, and most especially to your neighbor through you. Amen. Can you please go sit down? Can you please go sit down?
please rise and turn to the Nicene Creed as we confess our faith together. Believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, of the prayers of the people can be found in your bulletin. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray, Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask you for your prayers and thanksgiving. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. O oh God, for for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy. Grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and unhumbly content. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in you. Walk on your face. Amen. 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 Amen.
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. And peace, everyone. You may be seated for just a few announcements. First of all, of course, we want to welcome all of you who are worshiping with us today. We want to extend a special thanks and, and welcome to those of you who are visiting with us. Uh, we also have some delightful people that I happened to go to school with uh, many moons ago. Uh, they are here after having spent a goodly amount of time serving as missionaries in Jerusalem, uh, Colin and Jenny Grandgard. I think Jenny is managing another child. Um, <laughs> We also want to greet everyone who is here with us today online, so if we can all turn and wave to those who are with us. We're glad you're here too. And we have just a few announcements. I think Elena would like to make the first. Hi, everybody. Uh, as your junior warden, um, Lou, as your senior warden, we want to invite you on Saturday the 16th from 10 to 2 to help with a moving party. And we need all hands on deck if you're able. It's from 10 to 2. We're going to be moving the items in the little room uh, in the parish hall, which are important to Redeemer, and they're going to go upstairs to a room because Natalie, <laughs> Natalie <laughs> would like to have that space uh, for her workspace, and it enables her to be closer to the action around here instead of way up on the second floor in the rector's study. We're going to have sandwiches and drinks and music and fun. Yeah. And, um, and hopefully Evangeline will come too. And even if you can't uh, carry boxes, we could use some cheerleaders, um, anything. We hope that it'll be an easy task. And we would appreciate all your help. And um, if you're a little bit hot today, um, we have good news for you. In the next week or so, the new furnace will be installed and it's going to have air conditioning for our name. Can I get an amen? Amen! <laughs> so, uh, you may or may not know that we received a $15,000 grant from the diocese to help pay for that. So, uh, we feel very blessed to have um, that kind of resource to us. So, if you really like to sweat in here, you make sure you get to church every day until that's installed. <laughs> Thank you. Lee, please. So, following Work Camp Saturday is Sunday, Sunday, where you can all come as a reward and make an ice cream Sunday with many different flavors of ice cream and toppings. <laughs> and lastly, two announcements in one. Please pay close attention to your Thursday newsletters, which you receive by email. If you are not on the email list, please make sure that I or our administrative assistant, Rana, receives it so you can be included. Uh, the one thing I want to lift up to you in recent announcements is that there is a hit Tony musical coming to Pittsburgh in November. Uh, it's called Hades Town, uh, and you can find the exciting way that I have introduced it in your newsletter. Uh, Hades Town is a really wonderful and exciting musical. Uh, it's also going to be, I, I've purchased a block of tickets for uh, Redeemer at a discounted rate, so you can purchase into that block of tickets for the evening that we're going. And that's going to serve as sort of an entree for us to start having a book study, a book study connected with a Bible study on human anthropology and the nature of sin. Because who does not want to get ready for Lent? Honestly, I found just such a great book. It's going to be so much fun. It is a gripping and exciting and very accessible thing to read. Um, and so, uh, and I think that we can enjoy a night out on the town to, to join together with that topic. Uh, whether or not you participate in the book study is besides the point, but please plan to purchase tickets and come with us. 
This is also the first Sunday of the month, and so we want to acknowledge birthdays and anniversaries. So who was born in July? <laughs> Well, I guess there's no one. <laughs> My daughter, Miriam, is going to turn six next week. <laughs> so, Miriam, if you want to stand up, uh, do we have any anniversaries? All right, Miriam, stand up so we can give a prayer for you. Oh, God, our times are in your hand. Look with your favor, we pray, on your servant Miriam as she begins another year. Grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 We also want to invite up the Duff Hansen family. We are so sad that they are leaving. But we certainly would not want to have them leave without offering a word of blessing and gratitude. So please turn to page 13 of your bulletin so we can participate in the service of farewell and Godspeed. Everyone should also know they are moving to upstate New York. The, the Duff Hansen family is leaving our congregation and we wish to bid them farewell. In holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ received you and made you members of his church. And when you came to this parish, we rejoice to receive you into our fellowship. Into this community of faith, you have heard the proclamation of God's word, which reveals his loving purpose for you and for all creation. You have been nourished at Christ's holy table and called to be witnesses to the gospel. God has blessed you in this fellowship, and God has blessed us through you. We encourage you to continue to share and receive God's gifts in your new parish as workers with us in the kingdom of God. We give thanks for the mission we have shared. Thank you for joining us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to the world. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for the Duff Hansen family and for our life together in this parish and community together. As they have been a blessing to us, so now send them forth to be a blessing to others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in God. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal love, Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has died. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death and resurrection and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joys of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our freedom and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us people. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and receive them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray together. Eternal God, Jesus once sent out the 70, saying, carry no bag, wear no shoes, no nothing, except the love of God in Christ Jesus. So you are called and equipped for the same. Go, and may the peace of God that you share with others rest upon them to bring faith and hope and all goodness into the world and spaces you occupy. And may the spirit of truth lead you into all truth, giving you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and to proclaim the wonderful works of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Serve the 